Welcome back to Wichita State University's Lifelong Learning Program. I'm Heather Merchant, and this is the Geology of Natural Disasters. And before we get started, we have a few um, messages to read. So first, um, please turn off your cell phones, or at least put them on silent mode during the class. At the end of the lecture, we'll have time for questions, and you can come over here to the microphone on my right, and please stand on the blue X, and we ask that you don't touch the microphone. About halfway through, we're going to take a 10-minute bathroom break, and the bathrooms are out this door, as you probably already know. Ladies' room is on your right, and the gentlemen's room is on your left. Um, and if you're in the online portion of the class and you have any questions, please submit them by email. Okay, so we're now up to week four. This is our final week, and we're going to cover hurricanes and tornadoes. So for most of us, especially in the Midwest in the, or in the United States, these natural disasters probably are more familiar to us than some of the others, and they've probably touched our lives in some way at some point. So we're going to cover hurricanes and tornadoes, but before we can understand what causes them, we need to have a little bit of a base knowledge about atmospheric circulation. So we're going to start off with that, which will lead us into hurricanes and then tornadoes. Okay, so we all know that air moves. We, we know what wind is. We know there's um, air currents and patterns. But why is air moving? If we wave our hand in the air, we can feel it moving. We know that we're physically moving it. But on a global scale, why is the air circulating? Why is it moving? Well, it's moving in response to uneven heating from the sun and Earth's rotation and something called the Coriolis effect. And the little diagram here, I chose it because it's so simplistic in its design. And all we really need to remember in this is that warm air rises and cool air sinks. And the reason why is due to its density, its weight. So when things are lighter, they rise. When things are heavier, they fall due to gravity. So let's say that we have a cube right here. It's just a cube of air. And we weigh it, and it has, let's just say it weighs 100 grams, which is far more than it would. But let's just for the purpose of the exercise. Let's just say it weighs 100 grams. And it's at room temperature. Now we drill a little hole in the top of the cube. And they decide to turn the heat on in here, unfortunately. And they warm us up to about 100 degrees. So those molecules are going to start expanding. So they're not going to fit in that little box. So some of them are going to come out. So now we've got the same, the same size. Our box didn't get any bigger, but we're actually holding less air in it. So we weigh it now, and we're at, let's say, 75 grams. So when you warm things up, that's how they get lighter. Um, and when things get lighter, they rise. And then when they cool down, stuff starts to contract and it gets colder, and then it gets heavier because more of something can fit in the same area. And that's the whole concept with what's causing air movement globally. So where are we getting the heat from? We probably already all know we're getting our heat from the sun. And it's warmer at the equator and colder at the poles. And we generally think it's colder at the poles because it's farther away from the sun. And although that's true, there's a little more to it than that. If you take one square meter 
of solar energy from the sun. You can see from the image, it's hitting the equator straight on. So that one square meter solar beam is covering one square meter of Earth's surface at the equator. When you get up to the poles, it's not flat, it's at an angle, it's curving. So therefore that one square meter hits and then it spreads out. So it's covering more surface than it does at the equator. So you have the same amount of heat, but it's being dissipated greater. And that's why not as much, that's why it's not as hot at the poles. And then there's something else that happens at the poles. There's a lot of frozen snow and ice as very light colored and the heat actually bounces off. So that's one, um, yeah, okay. Okay, so we're getting much, much more heat at the equator than we do at the poles. So if we didn't have any air moving around, it would stand to reason that the oceans would be boiling at the equator and that everything would be frozen solid at the poles. And we do have a lot of, a lot of water, ocean water that's frozen at the poles, but it's not entirely frozen. So why is this not so? Well, the heat is moving around the globe. So when it hits the equator, it doesn't just stay at that temperature. It starts to rise up because it's really warm, so it rises, and then it starts to move towards colder areas, towards the poles, it becomes hot. I mean, it becomes cold, it becomes dense, and it starts to fall, and then it gets pulled back towards the equator where, where it's warmed up and comes back. Um, and then the other thing that goes into the temperature differences and affects air circulation patterns is the different heating of the earth according to the seasons. So when we're having our winter in the Northern hemisphere, we're tilted about 23 and a half degrees away from the sun. And that's when the Southern hemisphere is having their summer since they're 23 and a half degrees closer to the sun. And so the opposite occurs during our summer and their winter. And again, this is, this is changing heating patterns and temperatures, which is gonna drive air circulation patterns. So if that's all there was to consider, we would basically have two giant air circulation cells. We would have one in the Northern hemisphere and one in the Southern hemisphere. So we would be taking in the heat at the equator at a much greater rate than on the poles. And then that heat would be traveling to the poles to the colder regions, falling and then coming back to the equator. But that's not actually what happens. That's very simplified. So what we actually have is we're broken into three major circulation cells in the Northern hemisphere and three in the Southern hemisphere. And this is due to something called the Coriolis effect. So to explain the Coriolis effect, let's pretend that Buffalo, New York and Quito, Ecuador are gonna have a war with each other and they're gonna shoot a missile directly at each other. So they know where the other one is and they shoot it straight towards them and they don't take anything else into consideration and it just goes straight. Well, as you can see from the globe there, the missile trajectory for both of them, it goes off course, it kind of bends. And that's because they directed it straight so the earth is rotating on its axis. So while something is in the air, in this case, the missile is in the air, 
the earth begins to rotate. So instead of, so where the missile is still going straight, but it's an optical illusion that it's curving because the earth has actually moved, it's rotated. So it's kind of a hard concept to conceptualize in, in your mind entirely. So there's a little video here and he does an experiment. It's a nat National Geographic. He does an experiment with these people and on a merry-go-round and they throw a ball. So when they're throwing the ball, imagine that the ball is air and that'll help you conceptualize um, air circulation patterns and why it, it's just not going straight to the poles. With a simple game of catch, I think I've found a way to show an effect that will have you doubting your very own eyes. Now, they don't know it yet, but our budding ball players sitting on our specially rigged merry-go-round are about to demonstrate a rather astonishing optical illusion. Right, here's the game, right? You're going to throw the ball straight. So what's your name, Victor, right? But this time, I'm going to complicate things slightly. I'm going to rotate the merry-go-round counterclockwise. So you throw it whilst it's moving. What's going to happen? I don't know why, but I feel like if we're going fast enough, yeah. like I might actually be the one catching the ball. OK, so you're going to throw it and you're going to catch it. All right. Right. What's going to happen, dude? I was going to veer off to the left. So the ball is going to swim off to the left. Yep. And you might catch it. Possibly. Okay, good. Right. So what's going to happen? <laughs> I think it's just going to come straight to me and I'm going to catch it like the champion that I am. Show me the catch. <laughs> okay, great. Right. Okay. So everyone, no, hang on. One more. He's not, he's not arrogant. Just quietly he's confident. He's not catching it. He's not really? catching it. No. no. So what's going to happen to the ball? I'm catching it. It's right here. Great. So we've got one saying to go off to you. One second comes to you, Spencer, and you think it goes straight ahead, but you think you'll be the one catching it. Yeah. Now remember, the ball will be thrown straight across the spinning merry-go-round, but where will it end up? Will it be caught by the thrower? Will it be caught by the person opposite? Will it be caught by the person to the thrower's left? Or by the person to the thrower's right? Yeah. Right, in your own time, throw the ball. I got this. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> so the answer was D. It was caught by the person on the thrower's right. Our camera angle seemed to show the ball bend in the air. So is that a camera effect, or are we seeing what they saw? Hang on, this, this couldn't get much more simple. The idea was just to throw the ball straight to Victor to show us his amazing catching skills. That's right. Yeah, it did. It just curved, just curved right over this way. So let me get this straight. So you threw, somehow you threw the ball, it left your hands, and then what? And then it just got sucked over to him. In the air. Yeah, I threw a perfect <laughs> throw. What yeah. did you see? <laughs> yeah, curved right in. Right, so we all agree here the ball curved in midair. Yeah. Yes. And you didn't put you didn't cheat this at all. No, I didn't. Okay. And do you know why it did that? No. Nope. No idea. It's called the Cordelis effect. And it's very simple. It's objects in motion appearing to be, it's an optical illusion, appearing to be deflected off their intended course. So what's actually happening here is you are throwing this ball. You can only throw a ball in a straight line. Can I clear that up straight away? Yes. Even though it appears in your eyes to be bending. So you throw the ball straight, it's still going straight, but the table is moving below you. And all of a sudden, look who's in front of that straight moving ball. I and mean, it looks like it's bent off to the right because you're still looking at the guy you were intending to throw it to. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a cold illness effect. So I wish they would have shown the camera from above not moving with the merry-go-round as well. And you would have been able to see that the ball was going straight and the people were moving. Um, but anyways, that should, that should help explain that. Um, it's a very interesting and fun thing to think about. Okay, so when variations happen in these large-scale atmospheric circulation cells, that's when we get things like storms, extratropical cyclones, tropical cyclones, and a very large tropical cyclone is a hurricane. So when we get variations, those are things like areas or regional low pressure zones, high pressure, um, 
things of that nature, anything that's going to disrupt the circulation, temperature, things of that nature. And these are generally regional differences. Um, so they're in one area. Storms are something that forms between air masses. So you have two different air masses and the storm is occurring because they're going past each other. So in order for air masses to mix, it would require a lot of energy and they usually don't have this, this amount of energy is usually not available to them. So the dense air is heavier and it's gonna slide underneath the lighter air mass. So when it's sliding underneath it, it's pushing it up a little bit. And when it pushes it up and lifts it, it's causing this air to expand and then it cools. And when it cools, it starts to condense and form things like storm clouds, rain. And then we have the extratropical cyclone. And these form between two air masses, whereas the storm could actually occur between two or more. But the extratropical cyclone is only between two, and it forms between the boundaries of the polar and feral cells. So those are the two, when we saw the three circulation cells, those are the two towards the top. The polar one is at the top, and then the feral one was the second one down. These always move eastward in the northern hemisphere, and they occur in the winter. And you've probably heard about nor'easters in New England. So nor'easters are extratropical cyclones. And the cold wind is moving from east, and then warm wind is coming from the west, and where these two meet, and they don't like to mix, and they start to spin because they're, they're trying to go down and one's trying to go up and eventually they start spinning. Um, this twisting is the cyclone. And it can typically last anywhere from about two to five days. And these are not near as intense or strong as hurricanes are. So now we'll look at hurricanes. So how does a hurricane or a tropical cyclone, um, how is it born? It, scientists don't know exactly. There's still a lot to learn about hurricanes. But they do know that it occurs when warm ocean water is evaporating. So when it evaporates, it's bringing a lot of moisture with it. So it's very warm, very humid. And when it rises, it starts to cool. So when it cools, it, can <clears throat> it condenses, starts to form water molecules, which turn into storm clouds. And in this particular instance, it's sort of shaped like an anvil. So it's kind of wide at the top. It comes down. It's a little thinner towards the center. And then it gets a little wider again towards the bottom. And once again, as we have different densities in the air and different temperatures, and they're trying to mix, and one is pushing the other one down while one's pushing one up, and it starts to spin. So it stays as a tropical cyclone until it reaches wind speeds of 74 miles per hour or greater. But once it hits 70, the 74 mile per hour mark, it's designated as a hurricane. Now, when they move over land or water that's cooler, they start to slow down because the humid air that they need for that energy, bringing that heat with it, they're not able to get it anymore because the temperatures are cooler. And that's when they sort of die down and fizzle out and you don't have a hurricane anymore. So these form in one air mass. That's how they differ how they're different from the first two, from storms and extratropical. These form within one air mass, so it's not two coming together, it's just one. And that's, that's the part that's not fully understood why, why that occurs. Um, 
And there's about 100 hurricanes across the globe every year. And these always form between 10 and 25 degrees latitude. And it's always in the late summer or the early fall because that's the time when the water is at its warmest and it's able to, to um, produce enough warm, humid air um, to give the hurricane enough energy. <clears throat> and they always move counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere and clockwise in the southern hemisphere. And a cyclone or a hurricane can last anywhere from about three hours to three weeks. So they can last quite a long time if, if the circumstances are right. And they can travel at about 12 to 40 miles per hour. And here's a little National Geographic clip showing how hurricanes form. Violent winds, driving rain, killer waves. These are the hallmarks of a hurricane. Also called cyclones or typhoons, hurricanes are giant storms prowling the world's tropical seas. An average hurricane releases as much energy in a day as the explosion of half a million small atomic bombs. Hurricanes form in the summer and fall when the sun heats vast stretches of tropical ocean to over 82 degrees. Warm, moist air rises over these hot spots, creating thunderstorms. Upper level winds and surface winds then come together, forming a circular pattern of clouds known as a tropical depression. When the winds exceed 39 miles per hour, a tropical storm has developed. When the winds reach 74 miles per hour, a hurricane is officially born. Inside the storm, bands of rain up to 300 miles long meet in the eye wall, the most violent section. Here, winds of up to 200 miles per hour spiral upward. Within the center of the hurricane, downdrafts of dry air create a strangely calm area called the eye. Fully formed, a hurricane may stretch over 500 miles in diameter. That's a storm nearly the size of Texas and reach a height of nine miles. Most of these storms spin out over the open sea, but in an average year, two or three will strike the mainland of North America. And when they do, the damage can be catastrophic. Most dangerous is the storm surge, a wall of water that sweeps across the coastline where a hurricane makes landfall. About 45,000 people were killed by hurricanes in the 20th century, including some 15,000 in the United States. Hurricanes are also costly in dollars. 1992's Hurricane Andrew was the most expensive natural disaster in U.S. history, causing more than $25 billion worth of damage. Scientists are searching for better ways to predict the path of a hurricane. Special planes called hurricane hunters fly directly into these monster storms and drop sensors to measure wind speed, temperature, and air pressure, providing vital clues to the hurricane's direction. New 3D models are also helping scientists understand this awesome force of nature and provide quicker and more accurate warnings to anyone unlucky enough to be caught in its path. <clears throat> so when we've heard about tornado, I mean, hurricanes on the news, we always hear it classified as either a Category 1 hurricane or Category 5. And so the scale that they're using is the Saffir-Simpson hurricane wind scale. It was created by two meteorologists, Saffir and Simpson, in 1971. And currently, it's a scale from 1 to 5. However, there's some scientists and meteorologists who feel that we really need to add a Category 6 and a Category 7 
especially if the planet starts to warm more, we're going to have a lot more um, hurricanes and probably greater intensities. So it's still being debated, but they're thinking about adding a six, maybe a seven. And the U.S., in the U.S. at least, the National Hurricane Center, they measure the winds coming off the hurricanes. And whatever the maximum speed of the wind off that hurricane that was sustained for at least one minute, that determines which category the hurricane is. So on my list on the right, I added tropical depression and tropical storm, their wind speeds, so you could compare it with the hurricanes. But they're not part of the Saffir-Simpson scale. So a tropical depression, which is the least violent of, of hurricanes, it's less than 38 miles per hour. And then tropical storms are 39 to 73. And then you can see category one, two, three, four, and five. Category five is extremely rare. And those winds are over 155 miles per hour. So in the past couple weeks, we covered, yeah, oh, and also before we start, I would like to say there are three typos in these slides. And it's clearly a sign that I should not be making these in the middle of the night. But uh, yeah, so there should be just like mentally put a C in there. Well, in the past few weeks, we've talked about a lot of natural disasters, including flooding. Um, and that's one of the main damages of hurricanes is the flooding. And then there's also wind-induced damage. Now, the wind speed that you're feeling, whether you're a person or a building, it's not just the wind speed of the hurricane. It's intensified by the fact that the hurricane is actually moving. So you have these steering winds that are coming off it as well as the wind directly off the hurricane. So if you're standing in a hurricane's path and it's coming towards you and it's 120 mile per hour hurric hurricane winds, you're going to feel those winds, and then you're also going to feel the additional steering winds. And in this example, let's say that those are 12 miles an hour. An hour. So the wind speed that you're feeling is going to be 120 plus the 12. So you're actually going to be experiencing winds of 132 miles an hour. And the opposite is true if you're not in the path of the hurricane, if you're behind it or if it's traveling away from you in some way. In that case, you actually subtract because the wind is being pulled and it's, it's hitting in the opposite direction, the hurricane wind coming towards you. So it, the, what you're feeling is diminished. And in that case, um, there's an example in the diagram of hurricane wind speed of 175 kilometers per hour, but you're standing behind the hurricane. So it's moving forward at a rate of 25 miles per hour. So what you're actually feeling is the 175 minus the 25. So you're only feeling winds of 150 miles per hour. So hurricanes are still very hard to predict. However, they are quite a bit easier to predict and they're more accurate at predicting hurricanes than they are most of the other natural disasters that we looked at, especially earthquakes. So meteorologists, they look at some early predictors for how bad a hurricane season is going to be. And they measure things like the tropospheric winds. They look at the West African climate. If it's been really wet in the past year, that means that there's 
going to be more hurricanes. If the equatorial Pacific waters are warming, which is a phenomenon called the El Nino, that means that we're actually going to have fewer hurricanes that year. If there's lower than usual atmospheric pressure over the Atlantic Ocean and the Caribbean Sea, that's a year where there's going to be more hurricanes. And then as the global temperature increases, we have more hurricanes. Because remember, once that water starts to warm, it starts to, it starts to raise up and evaporate and bring that moisture with it. And that's what feeds, that's the energy that feeds the hurricane. So 2005 was the warmest year ever on record in human history. And that was also the year with the most hurricanes. And so here's a little clip that explains why it's still so hard to predict hurricanes accurately. You've seen it on the news, hurricane forecasts with weather maps and storm paths in alarming red. But most of the time, they're not exactly accurate. Here's why. The trickiness to weather predictions comes from the fact that the math meteorologists use isn't exactly accurate. Hurricane predictions and weather patterns are based on equations. Scientists input data about the hurricane, like wind speed and water temperature, but they make a lot of assumptions, and that's where the errors start. For example, in 2004, Hurricane Charlie was supposed to directly hit Tampa. Instead, in a last-minute shift, the Category 4 storm barreled down on Charlotte Harbor, Florida, a two-hour drive south of Tampa. The end result was a downtown reduced to rubble and residents underprepared. On the positive side, Hurricane Sandy took an almost unprecedented turn west towards New Jersey and New York that computer models nailed. Sandy was one of the biggest natural disasters in U.S. history. Without predicting that turn, who knows how much worse it could have been. So why can't we always see these changes coming? You've probably heard of the butterfly effect. It's the idea that a butterfly flaps its wings in one part of the world, and that movement can have unforeseen effects across the planet. This illustrates why it's so hard to predict a hurricane's path because there are too many independent variables and too much data. Any tiny errors or omissions in the predictive model can corrupt the algorithm. It's called chaos theory. It means that there is so much information that the precise movements are impossible to predict. So what do scientists do to make their predictions more reliable? They turn to human intuition and history. Meteorologists utilize statistical models that use the storm's location and time of year to compare it to past hurricanes. It's the fastest and most reliable way to predict storm intensity, according to hurricane specialists at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. They also simply sit down with the data and try to determine if the computer model is painting an accurate picture based on the conditions. Sometimes humans do it better than computers. So what would scientists need in order to make more accurate predictions? For one, more data. Things like speed, direction of wind high in the atmosphere, and more ocean temperature data are all stats that affect intensity that scientists don't have yet. For another, they need more powerful supercomputers. There's already so much data that it takes days to reach a prediction. It'd take even longer with all that extra data. And days could be the difference between a city being ready for a storm or not. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching. Okay, so now we'll go ahead and look at a few historic hurricanes. And... I bumped the cord. <laughs> um, okay, so we'll look at a few historic hurricanes, and then we're also going to look at the double header that could possibly uh, be hitting uh, the Gulf Coast within a day or two. Oh, and also on here, I switched out uh, one of the hurricanes. I I got rid of Hugo and I threw in Hurricane Andrew instead. I thought it'd be more fun. Okay, so Hurricane, some of the 
largest and most historic hurricanes we're not going to cover, like the Galveston 1900 hurricane, because we've covered them in other weeks, um, especially the flooding week, since hurricanes and flooding are so intertwined. So I picked all new ones. So Camille happened in 1969. It affected the Gulf Coast and the eastern uh, seaboard, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Alabama. It was a Category 5, so it was the second most intense on record to strike the United States. It killed 259 people, and it caused $1.42 billion in damage, but those are in 1969 dollars, so that would be a lot, a lot more today. And 3,000 homes just completely disappeared. Hurricane Camille was historic. In 1969, satellite images and radar data were very limited, so the details of Camille are not perfect. Air Force and Navy hurricane hunters at the time verified a powerful storm with a rapid intensification in the Gulf of Mexico. While Camille had origins as just a tropical wave off the coast of Africa, it did not develop until it reached the Western Caribbean. After landfall, it went through Mississippi, through Kentucky, through Virginia, and then off the eastern seaboard. The two largest impact areas were the Mississippi coast and central Virginia. Camille made landfall near Waveland, Mississippi, just before midnight on August 17, 1969, as a Category 5 hurricane. Wind was estimated at 170 miles per hour with a central pressure of just 900 millibars. Hurricane Camille had an obvious impact on the physical structure of the Gulf Coast, but communities like Waveland, they remember the impact that it had on people. For low pressure, Camille was the second strongest hurricane at landfall to hit the mainland United States. It was stronger than Hurricane Andrew in 1992, but not as strong as the 1935 Labor Day hurricane in the Florida Keys. From Hurricane Camille, the dollar loss was about one and a half billion dollars. Given inflation, 50 years later, that would be about 10 billion dollars. The Mississippi Gulf Coast, places like past Christiane, where I am, devastated by Hurricane Camille. St. Louis Bay, across the way, same story. Storm surge, a big deal. A big deal in destruction. However, a lower population density in 1969 is why the damage cost was far lower than many hurricanes seen since. The Richelieu Apartments in past Christiane, before and then after. More than a half dozen people lost their lives there. With over 80,000 people evacuating, the smaller population also limited the number of lives lost. Death toll was about 256, so Camille was not one of the deadliest U.S. hurricanes. Over a hundred of the people killed perished all the way northward in Virginia from intense flooding. One to two feet of rain fell in central Virginia. Rain along the Mississippi coast was under 10 inches, but the storm surge was extreme. Hurricane Camille left its mark on the Gulf Coast, later followed by Katrina, but look at that storm surge in Gulfport, 24 feet. That tells us that extreme wind was only part of the cause of damage. Trinity Episcopal Church, before Camille, and then after a building that was to be Episcopal High School before and then after. Farther eastward along the coast, places like Biloxi were also devastated. In Mississippi, more than 5,000 homes were destroyed. More than 10,000 had major damage. Because of changes in society and population, it's harder to compare a storm so long ago with those of recent decades. But Camille lives in history, an intense storm that cannot be forgotten.
I'm meteorologist Alan Seals. Okay, on to Hurricane Andrew from 1992. I decided to throw this one in instead because this was actually the only natural disaster that I've ever been in. So when I was about 15, we moved to Houston. And my dad was in the Army. And then as soon as we got there, we had rented a furnished apartment temporarily, you know, while house hunting. And probably about three or four days after we were there, dad got sent back to Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio. So my mom and I were in the apartment by ourselves. And it was probably about a week later, Hurricane Andrew was going to hit. And so it was getting pretty bad outside. Um, very stormy, a lot of water hitting the windows. And they came around and they put these notes on our apartment doors saying that it wasn't mandatory, but they really recommended that we evacuate and go to a safe location. They didn't offer any any ideas of where to go on the on the paper. Now, we had never lived in a coastal area ever. My mom and I, we didn't know, you know, what, what you do during a hurricane. Um, so we decided to stay, which looking back was probably a pretty bad decision. Um, but there were quite a few other people in the apartments that stayed as well. Um, we did not have any injuries and we were far enough inland that there wasn't much structural damage to buildings um, other than intense flooding. But I have this memory of sitting in the window. It, they had window seats. They were these big windows and we were up on the third or the fourth floor. And I remember just sitting there and watching the water and thinking, my God, that's the most water I've ever seen in a storm. It was hitting the windows like it was a wave coming in. So everything turned out okay and we were fine. But looking back, we probably should have evacuated, you know, always better safe than sorry. But uh, that's my only natural disaster that I've ever lived through. So I, I wanted to include that one. And Andrew was actually a Category 5, so it was the most intense. And it hit a lot. Of, it didn't hit Houston very hard. It hit other areas much, much worse. I mean, it wasn't good in Houston, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't devastated like some of these other cities were. And so it killed 65 people, and it caused $25 million in damage. It affected Florida, Louisiana, the southern Gulf Coast, and the southeastern U.S. And here's a little um, news clip from Miami looking back at Hurricane Andrew 25 years later. So this was about three years ago. Florida, much of South Miami-Dade was flattened by the Category 5 monster. And the first of a series of special reports this week to commemorate the anniversary. CBS 4's Gary Nelson, who, like many of us, lived through Hurricane Andrew, takes a look back. In the morning dark 25 years ago, a howling wind blew across South Miami-Dade, and when dawn broke... It revealed unspeakable ruin, the most costly natural disaster in the history of the U.S. Terrible loss mirrored tens of thousands of times over, block after block, mile after mile, devastation after a night that we spent in the closet, laying on top of my baby. 
everywhere surreal images. How did that boat get there? Cars and trucks tossed about like Tonka toys, and toys, toys didn't stand a chance. If we lost our homes, we also lost places where we shopped and ate. Some churches looked like the devil himself had come to call. Everything that makes a community gone the wind. Homestead Air Force Base, the economic jet engine of South Dade, was demolished. Warplanes thrown around like cracked pieces from a G.I. Joe set. Utility crews came in not knowing where to start. Oh, man. This is like someone nuked this whole area. Ice and water were gold. Profiteers made a fortune on this truckload of ice that sold in minutes. This woman sobbed over missing out, but there were good turns. We're trying to help out. This family drove down giving away lunch from their van. Do you know where your next meal is going to come from after this? No, ma'am, I don't. She and her three kids, though, would not get lunch. The bologna sandwiches and milk ran out. This Howard Johnson's became a field hospital. <laughs> A wall fell on this boy during Andrew three days earlier. A volunteer doctor diagnosed a skull fracture and remarked over all the misery. They're without roofs, they're without their water, without their electricity. More like a third world country right now. Do you know that's against the law? You can go to jail? Looters went to work. Police would arrest hundreds. Signs like these were everywhere. It's been a long three days without sleep, partner. Businessmen and homeowners armed themselves. A sign on a roof expressed a sense of abandonment. From the county's emergency services boss, a question heard around the world. Where in the hell is the Calvary on this one? The president? I'm not going to participate in the blame game. Bristled, but got busy. <laughs> Huge military planes began to arrive, disgorging trucks and supplies and troops, and the commander declared, The cavalry is at full gallop now. They fed the masses and directed massive tent cities. Thousands left homeless, housed in tents, kept out of the rain. Teacher asked me, where do I live? It's not the address. I told the tent city. This was my street after Andrew. My wife's dad came down to help and brought his camcorder. That's what you see down the street. It's the damnest thing I ever saw. It was the damnedest thing any of us ever saw, and we could not imagine the hard weeks and years that would lie ahead. We still live in the same house, have shutters, impact windows, hurricane supplies, and our homeowner's insurance costs more than five times what it did. In Palmetto Bay, Gary Nelson, CBS 4 News. Floyd and Dennis both occurred in 1999. And I grouped them together because they occurred just two weeks apart. And they overlapped some of the areas that they affected. They were both category four hurricanes and Dennis killed 88 while Floyd killed 87 people. So they're very similar in nature. Dennis came along and dropped 10 inches of rain. So these places were already devastated. They were already flooded. They'd just been hit by a hurricane. And with a hurricane, two weeks does not give you much time to get back to normal or even get your bearings and figure out, you know, where you're going to go, how you're going to fix this. Um, so just two weeks later, along comes Floyd. Now with Floyd, it came and it just stayed. It didn't move out quickly like most hurricanes and storms do. It just sort of stuck. And it dropped over 20 inches of rain. So remember, you're dropping 20 inches on top of 10 inches. And that's why this one is, is historic and noteworthy. Um, and they both affected Florida and a similar area, but uh, Dennis was Florida, Alabama, and Georgia, while Floyd was Florida, Pennsylvania, and North Carolina. Um, and here's a little clip of Hurricane Floyd. So they talk a little bit about Dennis in here, but not a whole lot.
As Floyd moved on past the Bahamas and initially moved toward Florida and then turned and began to move northward up the east coast of the United States, it lost steam, went down to a Category 3, went down to a Category 2, and then as it approached us on uh, September 16th in 1999, it approached us from the south. Our concern, again, was we were very wet. We had already gone through a wet period of time. We just had six to 10 inches of rain come down. All the river basins are full. They're at their flood stage level. So our, our hope and our prayer in this case is that this storm's gonna hit and this storm is gonna run and come on through. It didn't. As Floyd came our way, it slowed down to a crawl and not only slowed down to a crawl, but as it was blocked, it expanded in size and eventually put down a rain canopy that delivered between 14 and 20 inches of rain all the way up river. So Hurricane Katrina occurred in 2005. So as I mentioned earlier, that was the hottest year ever on record. And it was also the year with the most hurricanes. Now, Katrina was only a Category 4. It wasn't a 5, even though when we hear about it and all the destruction, you would just assume that it, it's a 5. But it was actually a Category 4. And the reason why it caused so much destruction and so notorious was due to the levees breaking and the massive flooding that occurred. So as we discussed last week with flooding, a lot of times when man tries to build things and control nature, it'll work for small natural disasters. But then when the big one hits and it breaks what people have built to keep the water out, you have much, much greater flooding because you're letting more water in. So sometimes it's okay to try to control nature. Other times we make it worse on ourselves. But Katrina had winds of up to 145 miles per hour. 1,300 people died and over 1 million people were made homeless. And that was due to the flooding. Now, another thing with New Orleans in general is they have rerouted the Mississippi River. And because of that, the river is, well, New Orleans, um, the type of soil that it has, it compacts and it experiences subsidence, which is a gentle sinking. And it was never a problem before when the Mississippi River was allowed to, to flow where it wanted to flow because it would, it would fill these areas back in with the river silt and um, all the sediments that it brought from the north. It would, it would deposit them because it would slow down and these would fall out of the water column. Well, when they rerouted it to keep the river out and prevent river flooding, they're also they also stopped their land from receiving the sediment to build it back up. So it just keeps getting lower and lower. So they keep building more levees and more things to try to keep the ocean out, keep the river out, and preserve the city. Well, you, you can't fight nature forever. Um, so that's one of the reasons why this was so devastating as well. New Orleans right now is actually below sea level. Um, so if they took out the man-made structures, the city would be gone right now. When Hurricane Katrina struck New Orleans, entire neighborhoods vanished under 20 feet of water. The devastation ranks as one of America's worst natural disasters, but also one of the worst man-made disasters. That's because since its early days, New Orleans has been sinking. The soil in and near New Orleans is a tenuous combination of silt, sand, and clay. Over time, the soil compacts and sinks. Before the Mississippi River Delta was developed, the river flooded regularly. Fresh silt from the floodwaters 
replaced the sinking ground and kept the land above sea level. But New Orleans is built to keep the river out. High walls called levees have been erected around the city to keep rising river levels at bay. They have also kept out the silt and sediments. Without the renewing sediments, New Orleans continues ever so slightly to sink. Its present rate is three feet every hundred years. Parts of New Orleans today are eight feet below sea level. If another storm surge like Katrina breaches the levels, New Orleans will again be underwater. The odds of another flood are increasing because the ground under New Orleans is not all that's shrinking. So are the surrounding wetlands. Every hour, another two acres of wetlands disappears under the sea. Like the sinking of New Orleans, the reasons are largely man-made. Canals dug through the wetlands increase erosion and destroy habitat. And levees help funnel the silt out into the Gulf before it can be absorbed by the coastal wetlands. Ironically, it is the wetlands, not the levees, that truly protect New Orleans from the sea. Every three miles of wetland absorbs a foot of a storm surge, acting as Mother Nature's insurance policy against hurricanes. Since 1930, Louisiana has lost over 1,900 square miles of wetlands. By 2050, many barrier islands will disappear altogether. New Orleans is still sinking. Unless something is done, the Big Easy will slip beneath the sea with or without another hurricane. So New Orleans is sinking at a rate of about one foot every 30, 35 years. So that's a pretty good subsidence rate. Okay, so now on to, you've probably seen on the news, um, the double header, Laura and Marco that are coming. And I don't know how we got so lucky with, uh, I hate to say lucky about natural disasters, but I don't know how this class got so lucky with have, having great timing with all these natural disasters. I mean, our volcano week, we had a volcano. Uh, the earthquake week, there was an earthquake. And, you know, last week, you know, there were the California fires, which although we don't have a flood yet, it could, you know, that that's one of the factors into flooding. So, and now this week on hurricanes, we have what could be an historic hurricane coming. So I don't know why, but nature seems to be working with us. Um, so there's a double header, two hurricanes at once coming up in the Gulf of Mexico. And they were both forecasted to hit Louisiana and Texas this week. Um, as of yesterday, when I made this slide, Marco was supposed to hit Monday evening, and then Laura was going to hit a, less than 20, less than 48 hours later. Um, and if it occurred, this would have been the first time in history that this ever occurred. So the little diagram on the bottom shows both hurricanes coming in and the little dots that are white, that shows when it would reach hurricane status. So like category one hurricane status. I checked um, a few hours ago and it looks like Marco has now been downgraded to a storm. Um, Laura is, st is still, they still expect her to become a hurricane. They're thinking a category two hurricane and it'll probably hit Wednesday, they're thinking. So <clears throat> this will be interesting to keep watching and see what happens. Um, and here's a little, uh, a little piece on, I believe it's uh, Florida news. Oh, no, wait, I think it's a Louisiana piece. 
It's going to be very interesting next four days across the Gulf Coast. First, we have Marco. We are fairly sure we know what Marco is going to do. The intensity maybe could be a Category 1, maybe a tropical storm as we get towards landfall. So the latest, it's almost a hurricane. It could become a hurricane later on today. But it doesn't look like it has a chance to become a major hurricane. This should be a minor to moderate event in southern Louisiana, possible landfall early Monday afternoon. And then it will be a rain event as it moves into areas of Texas and it begins to weaken. So we kind of know, you know, that portion of the country, the northern Gulf Coast, is built for storms like that. So I think we're going to be okay. We'll have to worry about the storm surge a little bit in areas of coastal Louisiana. That highest would be late Monday morning into early afternoon. Now with Laura, this storm looks very impressive right now. It's only 45 mile per hour winds. But remember, it's over the Dominican Republic and Haiti, which has huge mountains. And western Cuba has huge mountains. So that's going to make it weaker. If it wasn't for the land interaction, this would already be a powerful storm. So once it comes off of Cuba, it's not over land anymore. It'll have two days to grow, Willie. We could even see rapid intensification. And right now, the Hurricane Center thinks this will be a Category 2 100-mile-per-hour windstorm somewhere between New Orleans and Houston Wednesday night. All right. We'll be keeping a close eye on both of those storms. Bill Karens, thanks so much, Bill. That little news clip was from two days ago. So things have changed a little since then. So now, are there any local effects of hurricanes? Um, obviously, we're very far inland and the, the wind and the water is not going to reach us. However, it does affect the economy. And a lot of times after a Gulf Coast hurricane, gas prices will increase, as well as insurance rates. And then another interesting thing that I didn't know about until I was researching a little bit is it's possible for flood damaged vehicles to creep into the Midwest car market. What happens is when cars are totaled in a flood and the insurance company totals it, they sell it to a salvage yard. And depending upon the state that it occurred in and the state that they're selling it to, there's a possibility, and it has occurred before, that the laws will allow them to sell the salvaged car to a dealer who's going to sell the car for use again. So it's just a, a little interesting thing there that could possibly affect someone. And before we go on to tornadoes, we're going to take our 10 minute break.
Welcome back. And now we're going to move on to tornadoes, which are probably quite a bit more familiar to most of us than some of the other natural disasters. Um, and it, it's a natural disaster that we, where we're at now, we're, at, we're always at risk of a tornado in any given year. So like hurricanes, a tornado formation is not entirely understood. Um, but we do know that they result from a severe thunderstorm with an updraft, which is called a supercell storm. It just like a hurricane, the movement of a tornado is counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere. And it's quite similar to a hurricane in the formation. Again, we've got that warm, moist air that's rising up from the ground. The warm air is, the warm, moist air is meeting cool, dry air, and they don't want to mix. So they start pushing, and then the other one pushes, and pretty soon they're spinning and creating a vortex. And then this vortex comes down and hits the ground, and then we have a tornado. And then it, it spins and it travels, and eventually, when it's no longer being fed by that warm, moist air, similar to a hurricane, it dissipates and dies down. And so here's a little um, Ted Ed explaining the formation of tornadoes. It helps to visualize it a little. They call me the tornado chaser. When the wind is up and conditions are right, I get in my car and follow violent storms. Crazy you say, perhaps, but really I chase these sky beasts to learn about them. I want to share with you what I know. Tornadoes are rapidly rotating columns of air that form inside storms, then connect with the ground via a funnel of cloud. When that happens, they tear across the earth, posing a huge threat to life and property. Because of this, there's a great deal of research into these phenomena. But the truth is, there's still a lot we don't know about how tornadoes form. The conditions that may give rise to one tornado won't necessarily cause another. But we have learned a lot since people first started recording tornadoes, like how to recognize the signs when one is brewing in the sky. Are you coming along for the ride? Tornadoes begin with a thunderstorm, but not just any thunderstorm. These are especially powerful, towering thunderstorms called supercells. Reaching up to over 50,000 feet, they bring high force winds, giant hailstones, sometimes flooding, and great flashes of lightning too. These are the kinds of storms that breed tornadoes, but only if there are also very specific conditions in place clues that we can measure and look out for when we're trying to forecast a storm. Rising air is the first ingredient needed for a tornado to develop. Any storm is formed when condensation occurs, the byproducts of the clouds. Condensation releases heat, and heat becomes the energy that drives huge upward drafts of air. The more condensation and the bigger the storm clouds grow, the more powerful those updrafts become. In supercells, this rising air mass is particularly strong. As the air climbs, it can change direction and start to move more quickly. Finally, at the storm's base, if there is a lot of moisture, a huge cloud base develops, giving the tornado something to feed off later, if it gets that far. When all these things are in place, a vortex can develop, enclosed by the storm, and forming a wide, tall tube of spinning air that then gets pulled upwards. We call this a mesocyclone, Outside, cool, dry, sinking air starts to wrap around the back of this mesocyclone, forming what's known as a rear flank downdraft. This unusual scenario creates a stark temperature difference between the air inside the mesocyclone and the air outside, building up a level of instability that allows a tornado to thrive. Then, the mesocyclone's lower part becomes tighter, increasing the speed of the wind. If, and that's a big if, this funnel of air moves down into that large, moist cloud base at the bottom of the parent storm, it sucks it in and turns it into a rotating wall of cloud, forming a link between the storm that created it and the Earth.
The second that tube of spinning cloud touches the ground, it becomes a tornado. Most are small and short-lived, producing winds of 65 to 110 miles per hour. But others can last for over an hour, producing 200 mile per hour winds. They are beautiful, but terrifying, especially if you or your town is in its path. In that case, no one, not even tornado chasers like me, enjoy watching things unfold. Just like everything, however, tornadoes do come to an end. When the temperature difference disappears and conditions grow more stable or the moisture in the air dries up, the once fierce parent storm loses momentum and draws its tornado back inside. Even so, meteorologists and storm chasers like me will remain on the lookout, watching, always watching, to see if the storm releases its long rope again. So after the formation stage of a tornado, there's two more stages that it goes through. It, <clears throat> as long as there's a source of that warm, moist air flowing into the tornado, it keeps growing. It keeps getting bigger. Once it reaches its maximum size, it's considered at the mature stage. So that's its full force, its full size. And this can take anywhere between a few minutes to over an hour to reach this size. Then once it reaches the mature stage, it'll go into the dissipation stage. And that's when that air supply gets cut off. The vortex, the spinning and the power of it, it starts to decrease. And then eventually the tornado ends. And this stage only lasts a few minutes. So tornadoes can take different forms, and they're referred to as tornado types. And there's a great many different ways that people have described these types or shapes of tornadoes. And I'm going to cover the six, the six most common um, types today. So a rope tornado is the smallest and the most common. You can see from the photograph that it looks just like a rope. It's very long. It's very thin. It doesn't have the, the traditional cone shape that you're used to thinking about with a tornado. But most tornadoes, they begin and they end as a rope tornado. So they're very weak when they first start, and then they get bigger, and then as they die down, they, they go back through this rope stage. And then there's the cone tornado. And it's shaped exactly like a cone. And these are much wider and they're more dangerous than a rope tornado. And the largest and most destructive kind is a wedge tornado. So you can see from the photograph, it's very big. It's very nasty looking. It's really wide. Um, it doesn't really have the traditional shape that we're used to thinking about. It's just looks sort of like a big massive thing, but it is still spinning. Um, it's got a little bit of a tornado shape to it. Um, and these can be over a half mile wide. And we'll get into how they're categorized in a few minutes, but the wedge is only an EF3 or higher on the scale that we're going to look at. There's also multi-vortex tornadoes. And this is when you have multiple tornadoes or twisters at the same time. So there's two or more. However, there's one main tornado and the rest of them are usually rope tornadoes. So they're not very powerful. Um, they're much thinner. But you can also have satellite tornadoes. And this is where there's two or there yeah, so there's two, but they're the same size. They're both large. They're not rope tornadoes. They're very destructive, and they're basically twins of each other. And that's extremely rare to have that. And there's also water spouts and land spouts. 
and these are interesting because they can actually develop without there being a thunderstorm present. So they're just developing because of the differences in temperature and pressure and the way the winds are, are pushing on each other and starting to spin. And when they occur out at sea or over any body of water, it, technically by definition, they are a tornado, but they're not listed, they're not recorded as a tornado. When it hits land, it'll be measured and recorded as a tornado. Um, but of course, the land spouts, when that occurs on land, it's recorded as a tornado. Okay, so the tornado classification system. Uh, tornadoes, well, there's three different kinds of classification systems. There's the Fujita scale, the enhanced Fujita scale, and the Toro scale. We used to use the Fujita scale, and it rates and categorizes tornadoes based on how much damage they caused. And it was an F0 through an F5. But the wind speeds, you can see in the second column of the table, those were based entirely off calculations. So they were estimating that a tornado that caused damage that would be in EF0 would have a three second gust of wind at about 65 to 85 miles per hour. Now, about 13 years ago, they updated this and they renamed it the Enhanced Fujita Scale, which is what's used today. So the EF numbers are the same. We still have zero through five, except they updated the gust mile per hours. So they're still based on calculations, but in addition to the calculations, they did they used engineering guidelines and some modeling. So they're a little more accurate than they used to be. Then there's also the Toro scale. It's very seldom used, and it ranks tornadoes anywhere from a T0 to a T11. But in the United States, you're almost always going to hear it ranked with uh, the enhanced Fujita scale. So what kind of damages do tornadoes do? We know that they have intense winds and, and they cause destruction that way to buildings, cars, even crops, infrastructure, cities, that sort of thing. But they also have an economic impact and they can kill and injure people. Now, luckily, about 80% of the tornadoes in the United States are at EF0 and EF1. So they're not, they're not too destructive. They're not very violent. And less than 1% of all tornadoes are considered violent, which would be an EF4 or stronger. With predicting tornadoes, it's very similar <clears throat> to how it is with, tor with predicting hurricanes. There's so many variables and things change that you can't really measure. Um, so we're still at that, that area where we're getting better at predicting them, but we're not perfect. But predicting tornadoes is, it's still a little more accurate than predicting an earthquake or may, maybe a volcano. Um, before the 1950s, there actually was no detection at all. The only way tornadoes were detected was when somebody reported that they had seen one touching ground. After that, meteorologists began using radar, storm spotting, some of the storm chasers, like in that Ted Ed video we watched, um, measurements of temperature and wind flow patterns, and once again, just like hurricanes, comparing the situation that we have and using a model 
um, models from the past. So getting better, but, but not perfect yet. There's still a lot to learn. And in fact, last month, the National Weather Service stated that there would be no storms at all in southwest Kansas. There was no risk at all. It was going to be fairly nice. And an EF1, so a very small tornado hit, but it did hit during a time when they said there was no risk at all of anything. So our predictions are obviously not, not perfect. So growing up, you probably have heard a lot of myths about tornadoes and how to stay safe in tornadoes. I know I did. Um, I was always told as a child if I ever was outside and saw a tornado to make sure that I went and hid in a ditch because a tornado can't go in a ditch. Um, that's not actually true. So some of the myths are a green sky means a tornado is coming. There's um, they found no correlation in that. That opening your windows will lessen the damage to your house if a tornado comes because of the pressure differences. And although there are pressure differences, the damage that leaving your windows open can cause far outweighs any benefit from equalizing of the pressure. And then after the 1991 tornado that hit Andover, there was a team from a news channel that hid under an overpass and they stayed safe and the tornado went past him. So after that, there was this, this myth and rumor that if you're, if you're on the highway and a tornado's coming to get out and hide under an overpass, which is actually a really bad idea because it doesn't always give you protection. It actually can increase the wind if it comes at just the right angle. So you're not guaranteed safety by hiding under an overpass. And then another interesting one is that if you go to the southwest corner of your basement, you'll stay safe. And again, that one's not true. Tornadoes can cross major rivers. Some people think that it can't cross a body of water, but it can. They can climb mountains and they can go into valleys. So myths such as, you know, if you're outside, hide in a ditch, you know, because the tornado can't go in the ditch. It's not true, but that's actually still good advice. Anytime you're around a tornado, you want to get low, you want to get under or around some type of protection. Okay, so now we're going to look at um, four historic tornadoes. And most of the tornadoes that occur in the world are in the United States, North America. However, they can occur in other areas of the world. And we're going to take a look at the most devastating tornado that ever occurred, which was in Bangladesh. So in 1840, in Natchez, Mississippi, the second deadliest tornado in U.S. history occurred. It caused about $32.3 million in today's, uh, today's value. It killed over 317 people and injured over 109. Most of those people who were killed, <coughs> excuse me, most of those people who were killed or injured were on boats in the river. So when the tornado came along, it just went along the Mississippi River and it just, it decimated the forests on either side of the river. And it killed everybody who was working on the river. So here's a little uh, weather history clip. I'm meteorologist Mark Van Cuso, and on this day in weather history, May 7th, 1840, the Great Natchez Tornado hit Natchez, Mississippi. The Fujita scale rating of this tornado is almost certainly an F5, but since there was no scale at the time, this tornado remains uncategorized. The tornado formed southwest of Natchez and moved northeast along the Mississippi River. 
The vortex then struck the river port of Natchez Landing. The mile-wide tornado tossed 60 flatboats into the river, drowning their crews and passengers. A piece of steamboat window was reportedly found 30 miles from the river. Many conducting business on shore were killed. The tornado then moved into the town. Its full width of devastation also included the river and the Louisiana village of Vidalia. The central and northern portions of Natchez were completely destroyed. The final death toll was 48 on land, 269 on the river, mostly from the sinking of flatboats. It's the second deadliest single tornado on record in the United States, killing 317 people. It is also the only recorded massive tornado in the U.S. that killed more people than it injured. I'm Mark Vincuso. And some articles on this tornado actually said that the death toll was probably a lot greater because at the time there were a lot of slaves that were working on the boats on the river and they didn't necessarily count those as lives lost at the time. So the death toll was most likely greater than, than what is listed. Okay, so in 1925, the deadliest tornado in U.S. history occurred. It affected Missouri, Illinois, and Indiana. With a lot of these historic tornadoes, especially ones that covered a large area and traveled through multiple states, at the time they thought it was one tornado, but meteorologists and scientists now think they were probably a series of related tornadoes and not necessarily one tornado. Um, but that's something that we'll never really know for sure. This particular one lasted three and a half hours and it covered 219 miles. There were 700 people killed and over 2,000 injured. The damage was a whopping $2.2 billion, and those are in today's dollars. Um, but that's, that's a very expensive tornado. I'm meteorologist Mark Mancuso, and on this day in weather history, Wednesday, March 18, 1925, the tri-state tornado crossed from southeast Missouri through southern Illinois and into southwest Indiana. The continuous track left by the tornado was the longest ever recorded in the world. Showers and cooling temperatures was the forecast for the day. When a time when tornado forecasting was non-existent, the Weather Bureau had been tracking a cold, low-pressure system moving towards southeast Missouri. The jet stream wasn't discovered, but its wind speed was probably very strong given how fast the tornado traveled. As a warm front surged northward, gray skies drizzling over southeast Missouri began to turn an ominous black. At 1 p.m., a column of twisting air materialized near the town of Ellington. Traveling at 72 miles per hour, it took 14 minutes to hit Annapolis, where it decimated 90% of the town. At 2.26 p.m., the storm approached the town of Gorham, Illinois, throwing golf ball-sized hail as it advanced. There was a great roar, and the air was full of everything all churning around together. It was the deadliest twister in American history. It whipped through four states, flattening 15,000 homes and killing nearly 800 people. Including additional tornadoes that day, thousand others were injured during this intense and early spring outbreak. I'm Mark Bincuso. And in 1947 in Woodward, Oklahoma, there was more than eight to 12 tornadoes that were confirmed. Um, and it actually affected Texas it moved into Oklahoma, and then it moved into a little bit of Kansas as well. This one started out as an F2 in Texas, so it wasn't, wasn't too bad. But by the time it hit Oklahoma, it had grown into an F5. So that's the most destructive tornado we can have. And it lasted over three and a half hours. I mean, three to five hours. It killed about 200 people and injured over 980 it produced $10.5 million in damage.
I'm meteorologist Mark Van Cuso, and on this day in weather history, April 9, 1947, a system of tornadoes swept through Texas, Oklahoma, and Kansas. The Glacier Higgins Woodward tornadic event was similar to the tri-state tornado of two decades before, and that it appeared to observers as a single, very long-lived tornado. Later analysis suggested that it was a multiple tornado outbreak. The tornadoes began in Texas and would cut a path of destruction through three states, ending near St. Leo, Kansas. When it struck and completely destroyed the small town of Glacier, it may have been as much as two miles wide. Afterwards, press reports told of two people that were found three miles apart who were known to be together before the storm struck. Much of Higgins, Texas was completely destroyed. The system then ransacked Oklahoma, where it passed through Woodward with a two mile wide track, wiping out 107 people and destroying 100 city blocks. Cleanup in the region was made more difficult because of the cold and snow that followed. Roughly 4,000 buildings and homes were leveled or heavily damaged, costing half a billion dollars in today's figures. The Glacier Higgins Woodward tornadoes were the sixth deadliest in U.S. history, killing 181 and injuring 970. I'm Mark Biancuso. In 1989, Bangladesh experienced the deadliest tornado in world history. It was designated as an F3, so it was an intermediate grade tornado. It killed 1,300 people, and when it hit these two towns in Bangladesh, they had already been experiencing six months of drought. So they were all already in a bad situation when the tornado hit. And it, it destroyed every home within six square kilometers and it left 80,000 people homeless. The deadliest tornado the world has ever known was the Daulatpur Satoria tornado. It hit the Manik Ganj district, Bangladesh, on April the 26th, 1989. It was an extremely vicious and destructive twister, killing an estimated 1,300 people. The combination of severe drought of the previous six months and poor housing contributed to the intensity of the devastation. The tornado tore through the cities of Daulatpur and Satoria, taking a path that moved east, then northeast. It carved out a route of concentrated destruction that was 50 miles long and one mile wide through the poorest areas and slums of Bangladesh. 80,000 people were left homeless and 12,000 people were injured by the storm. So where we're sitting in Kansas, we are smack dab in the middle of Tornado Alley. So you would think that we would have the most tornadoes, especially when you mention Kansas to anyone, they always think, oh, tornadoes or the Wizard of Oz tornado. But actually, Texas has the most tornadoes of any state. Um, we still have a lot of them, though. And so what happens is we have that warm Gulf air coming up and it meets with the cold, dry air coming down. And then there's warm, dry air coming from the southwest. And then there's the jet stream coming down from the north. And Tornado Alley is right where all of these uh, different pressure fronts and temperatures hit. And so you have a lot of opportunity for turbulence and movement and that's why there's so many tornadoes in this area. Now, shockingly, since we are known for tornadoes, none of our tornadoes made the 10 deadliest tornadoes in the U.S. list. None of them made the 25 deadliest tornadoes list. And none of them made the 10 costliest tornadoes list. So 
I checked a lot of lists and, and none of ours made those, but that doesn't mean that they weren't horrible and that we didn't have quite a few bad ones around here. And we're going to start off with Codell, Kansas. And although they weren't particularly bad tornadoes, it's a very interesting thing that occurred there. And it's something that it, it's, it's just an extremely minute percentage that what happened there could ever happen anywhere ever again. So on May 20th, 1916, they were hit with an F2 tornado. On May 20th, 1917, they were hit with an F3 tornado. And on May 20th, 1918, they were hit with an F4 tornado. So the same day, three years consecutive, and the tornadoes were increasing in intensity each time. It's an extremely rare, rare chance that that could ever occur. Now, the final tornado that hit them in 1918 destroyed almost all of the town. Um, there's still a little bit left there, but it's... Um, there's not much to it. It's a very, very small town now. But they were actually, this is so rare that they were actually mentioned in Ripley's Believe It or Not. And in the photograph is a picture of a statue of a cyclone. And it commemorates their cyclone day, which is May 20th. So there's a little bit of fun trivia there. I've never been there, but it'd probably be a fun place to go see. Well, in 1955 in Udall, there was an F5 tornado. So this is the most intense tornado that you can have. And two tornadoes hit in the same night. They were not, they were in close proximity, but not in the exact same place. And this is actually the deadliest tornado that ever occurred in Kansas. It traveled about 30 miles and it was three-fourths mile wide. So it was a pretty large tornado. It killed 80 people and it injured 270 people. Now in numbers compared to some of those other tornadoes, it's not all that great, but those numbers account for 70% of the population of this town. So it affected almost everybody there. It killed, I mean, it destroyed um, about 192 homes and buildings and it caused $2.23 million in damage. I'm meteorologist Mark Van Cuso, and on this day in weather history, May 25th, 1955, a deadly tornado outbreak struck the Great Plains. It produced at least 46 tornadoes across seven states, including two F5 tornadoes in Blackwell, Oklahoma, and Udall, Kansas. The Blackwell tornado formed in Noble County around 9 p.m. before crossing through the eastern portions of the Kay County town of Blackwell as a 500-yard F5 wedge. In addition to destroying nearly 200 homes, it demolished the town's main employers. The Blackwell tornado was notable because of the unusual electromagnetic activity that was observed, including St. Elmo's fire. Witnesses described the fire up near the tip of the funnel that looked like a child's 4th of July pinwheel with light so intense they had to look away. 30 minutes later, the same supercell that spawned the Blackwell tornado produced another violent tornado east of the first track near the Kansas-Oklahoma border. It proceeded northward and hit the town of Udall with F5 intensity. It disintegrated numerous structures and homes all across the town when the funnel, about 1,300 yards wide, hit around 10.30 p.m. It later dissipated after traveling over 50 miles from the Oklahoma border to southeast of Wichita, Kansas. Other tornadoes in the region occurred on May 27th near the same region, but did little damage. Overall, the entire outbreak caused 315 fatalities and over 5,000 injured. I'm Mark Van Cuso. Then there was a very, very strong F5 tornado that occurred in 1991 in Wichita and Andover. 
it was it traveled 46 miles it was a half mile wide it killed 17 people and injured 225 it caused $300 million in damage, and 62 of that was at McConnell Air Force Base. It destroyed some housing, the hospital, and a school. After leaving the Air Force Base, it then moved to Andover, where it destroyed an entire mobile home park. After leaving Andover, it continued to El Dorado, or El Dorado, and once it crossed the lake, it dissipated. And it's probably because the lake would have been cooler temperatures and it would have it would have stopped the airflow and the warm, moist air going up into the into the tornado. So um, here is some footage and I think this is a very exciting footage. It's somebody at the Air Force Base who was actually standing out there and filming it while it goes across the base. A very dangerous thing to do, um, not, the, not the wisest thing, but it does provide some, some very exciting footage. Um, out of all the videos, this is probably the, the best one that gives you a real feeling of the force and the strength of a tornado and what kind of destruction it can do. It's a little loud in the beginning though. Yeah, in that video, you can see it picking up and throwing things. And quite often in tornadoes, it can pick something up and deposit it miles and miles away. I think in one of those um, historic tornadoes, there was a, a couple who was together and it picked them up, or one of them up at least. And after the tornado, they were like three miles apart. So it's, it's just amazing what it can do. And that video gives you a sort of a sense of, of how strong and dangerous they are. Then in 2007, there was another Category 5 uh, tornado that hit Greensburg, Kansas. Um, I was living here by then, and I remember hearing about it and seeing the footage on the news. Um, any of you who were here in 91 probably have very vivid memories of seeing the destruction after that one as well. Um, this tornado traveled about 26 miles, and it was almost two miles wide, so very, very wide tornado. Um, it killed 11 people and injured 63. It destroyed almost 1,000 homes and businesses, um, and 523 structures were damaged. 
So that accounted for 95% of the town. And it caused about $250 million in damage. Few tornadoes surpassed May 2007's EF5 onslaught on Greensburg, Kansas. The most devastating tornado to hit the oh, Sorry, that's as loud as it goes. It travels by night, ripping a path of destruction 1.7 Thank goodness miles for captions. Wide and 22 miles long. Winds blow steadily at 200 miles an hour, with peaks up to 300 miles an hour. Houses are lifted off their foundations. Cars fly through the air, and steel structures are ripped apart. In the Greensburg tornado, it drove pieces of metal so deeply into trees that they're afraid to remove the metal for fear of killing the tree. The worst aftermath, hands down, that I've ever seen would have been the aftermath of the Greensburg, Kansas tornado. It was complete devastation. That tornado was almost two miles wide. It went directly over that town. And at any given spot, it was over that spot for 10, 12 minutes, grinding on whatever it was hitting. And it was just, it looked like a, an, a bomb went off. I heard stories of people that lived in that town their whole life, couldn't find where their house once stood. And walking around in that town, I felt so horrible for those people. 95% of Greensburg is destroyed and 11 people are killed. But authorities believe the death toll would have been much higher if it hadn't been for the success of the town's tornado warning system. Yeah, so at the end, that, that's a good point. You know, we're not very good at predicting tornadoes yet, but at least in, in this country, we do have the tornado warning system, which is really helpful. Um, and they believe that in Greensburg, the death toll would have been much, much higher had they not had that and most people followed uh, protocol to get to safety. And then if anyone is interested in learning more about Kansas tornadoes, um, Dr. Jay Price, who is a professor of history at Wichita State University, he has a little documentary lecture video on YouTube titled The History and Myths of Tornadoes in Kansas. I've started watching it, and it's very interesting. I haven't gotten to finish it yet, but um, I think a lot of you might be interested in it. Uh, if you have these slides digitally, you just have to click on the link. But if not, just go to YouTube and search for History and Myths of Tornadoes in Kansas, and it should come up. Okay, and now we're ready for questions. I have just a couple. One's a comment, and that's I was 10 years old when that Blackwell Udall uh, tornado hit. And we lived in Oklahoma and we took the train up to Kansas, to Wichita, and we went through there right afterwards. And it was devastated and it made such an impression. The biggest thing was the headlines that people had died in their basements because of flooding and gas. So for many years, I'm sorry, I would not go to the basement. <laughs> Yeah, because that's, that that's made such an impression on a ten-year-old child that I was—I yeah. just knew I would die in that basement. <laughs> but my question is: uh, sometimes these tornadoes and these storms seem to follow highways. And again, is that because of we build and that causes that air to go up and down, or does that not have anything to do with it? Because you know, it seems like that sometimes I'll. They'll say it's following a highway or following mm -hmm. roads, and I was wondering if that made any difference. Yeah, and sometimes it, it follows a river path, too. A lot of times on the Mississippi, it, it goes around. Um, there's no specific reason, really, why it would follow a highway. Um, 
a lot of times things are just coincidence. But um, yeah, thank you for your comments about the 1955 or 1945 uh, tornado. Yeah, um, yeah, that was really interesting. I'd never heard about the flooding or the, the gas in the basements before, but it definitely would make you second guess going to the basement. Does the Weather Bureau track the number of tornadoes each year? And if so, what is that number and is it increasing? Um, yeah, they do track the number. Um, yeah, I don't know the number offhand of how many occur each year, but as temperatures rise, just like with hurricanes, there's a chance and a risk of increased tornado activity. Changing the temperature of the planet affects so much, and then it's like they described the butterfly effect. Each little thing that changes, it affects something else, and it definitely leads to more storms and more turbulent weather patterns. Anyone else? Any online questions come in? Okay, well, in that case, I wanted to thank everybody for coming, and I really enjoyed our four weeks together, and I hope that you guys had fun and enjoyed it and learned something. And well, so, bye. Thank you.